excited to be here with uh, a bunch of my peers and uh, to continue learning from each other. One of the things I love about DevOps Days in particular is how much work everyone, the organizers, the attendees, put into making this a safe space for learning. I always learn a lot, and uh, it's really important to me. I want to emphasize a safe space for learning because as I was standing off to the side five minutes ago, I, I noticed the logo had these three crates being thrown off, and um, I realized this one says silos, and my talk is, is defending silos, so <laughs> please don't hurt me. Um, so I want to start with a story. Uh, you might recognize this story. Uh, I think many of us have, have lived through this or have friends who've lived through this. So I was working at a, at a company. I got my first job in R&D. It was great. Um, I was working at headquarters. There was one floor that had all the engineers. It was about 100 engineers. I got to learn how they did things. And uh, over the course of time, I got to do things too. I got to develop skill, get things done, ship code. I knew who to talk to and how to affect change. It was really, really great. Some of the people that I talked with had stories about previous acquisitions. So at this, at this point in time, the product group that I was working in had been acquired three or four times. And so one of the things that, that they took care to do was to make sure that all of the company names in the code were uh, defined as a variable. So it could be changed in one place every time they got acquired, rather than having to go change everything. Um, and then over time, we got acquired again and then again. And then, all of a sudden, I started to get frustrated. We were a Windows product, understood our market very well. Um, the company merged with a company that was very strong with Solaris products. So, um, we, we had all of our engineers in one location on one floor. All of a sudden, we had significant engineering teams in Pune, India, in Minnesota, in California, as well as Florida, where I was working. And everything changed. I started to get really, really frustrated. Um, I, I didn't know who to even talk to in other parts of the organization. And what's worse, when I did talk to someone, I didn't have any context about what their life was like, about what their shipping schedules were like, about what their work customs were, about uh, whether they were having parties, whether they were having good weather or bad weather, uh, you know, what sort of history and, and shared stories they had at their site. And it got really frustrating. So usually when we talk about silos, we um, use that as a metaphor for describing a team that is overly walled off, that is actually dysfunctional because of, of not being able to establish connections with other parts of the company. People working for the same company need to share information with other parts of the company and are frustrated or not able to do that. So you hear, hear stories about people who work um, rooms away from each other and don't know important information that they really should know. So there's been this big, big movement and popular talk about tearing down silos, removing barriers. Everybody loves to talk about full stack engineers and um, everyone, total transparency. Uh, you hear companies bragging about how they send all decisions to a company-wide email list and everyone has access to everything. And that's actually worse than the problem, right? That, that creates a huge cognitive burden on every single person who's attempting to be a part of that team. Um, it's even worse because it's really a recipe for hurting diversity. There really aren't any people who know all of the context and expertise needed to function in a company to make an organization run. When you start trying to focus too much on not having any boundaries, what you're really accidentally doing is saying, I want a whole bunch more people like me who share the exact same set of contexts and history and interests as me. And you end up making your organization very weak and fragile. So what do you do about that? Um, I want to share some ideas that I have um, encountered over the years. None of these are mine. These are all useful ideas that I've sort of discovered other people um, giving names to and, and having research uh, to back them up. But I've I found them to be totally consistent with my experience. They've been extremely useful in helping me make sense of the environment that I found myself um, trying to survive. And so I want to talk about some of these ideas. 
So the first one is um, the dangers of that silo metaphor. Uh, how silos actually work is, is really, really great. They, uh, there is significant engineering done to make sure that silos don't have anything going stale, that they protect the information inside from being contaminated, um, that when, when material needs to go in and go out of the silo, there's very well-defined places for that. Um, and so, so that metaphor really isn't correct. So then you have to start to ask yourself, what do we really mean? Well, what we're really talking about is identity. And, and this was kind of hard for me to wrap my head around at first, but we all negotiate multiple identities every day, even in the same conversation. And we do this, these are separate identities. We don't integrate these identities. They are not a blend. They are separate, conflicting identities that we carry with us. So a quick example would be um, if I am talking with a coworker about politics while driving um, a child to school um, for, for a, a PTA meeting, let's say. There's a lot of identities. Uh, we can count at least five different identities being brought to bear in that conversation. So one is as a citizen, we're talking about politics. One is as a professional, I'm talking with a coworker. One is as a motorist, I'm driving. One is as a parent, and one is as a community member. All of those identities influence who I am, the context that I have around, and I'm trying to balance all of those as I'm having the conversation. Um, and organizations do this too, right? Organizations also have multiple identities, and, and those shift over time. So, so then, really, what is a team? What are we complaining about when we, when we dislike the, the overly walled off team. So you can think of an organization as being a weak network of strong networks. So what if instead of, instead of trying to make everyone have strong links to everyone else, we've just had strong links with our work group. And your work group might be called a team or it might be called a squad or it might be called um, a, a, a team or a, a division. Uh, there's different ways of defining what that work group is. But if you have very strong links within that work group, and then you are able to establish weak links to other work groups in the team, in the, in the organization, and change those weak links over time, you start to get an organization that's much more resilient. And what's more, you start to get an organization, and uh, uh, as an individual and as a work group or a team, you become much more able to negotiate change. Um, so how do, you, how do you start doing this? Um, I'll take a, a brief diversion in, into, uh, I'll, most of us here work in organizations that do, um, that build software, right? And so building software, we spend a lot of time thinking about abstractions. And it's kind of funny that we love abstractions for the software, but then sometimes resist having the abstractions in our organization. So. Um, an example of a black box abstraction that we do not get to collaborate with that enables tons of innovation and provides lots of freedom is Amazon S3. I mean, when you think about it, you have a very weak link to S3. You don't know who works on it. You don't know exactly how it's implemented. You don't know a lot about it. You don't get to ask questions. You don't get to, to talk to that team. You don't get to collaborate about S3. But it's very well specified exactly what promises it makes and what promises it doesn't make. And as a result, many, many teams and organizations are able to innovate on top of S3. Many different organizations and teams are able to build the same interface, and so the implementation completely changes all the way down to the company that's providing the service. And that weak link, instead of a strong link, enables a much, much um, more powerful use. An example of a terrible interface might be uh, SOAP, right? So if you've ever worked with SOAP, that, that one was very, very heavy and complicated and, and uh, difficult to use, very leaky abstraction. And uh, so you didn't get any of those good things. It was always something custom, never portable. Uh, it, it's a bad abstraction. So how do you use those ideas and concepts in your organization? Well, the, the the best thing that I, I think you can do is very early on, when you are first having that experience of 
a good functioning team with strong links is to step back and start thinking about what are the identities of this team. And another word for identities is roles. What are the roles that this team plays? And try teasing them out and abstracting them. You don't have to, to divide responsibilities yet, but just think about what are the roles. And it's totally okay if all of the people have all of the roles at first. But as you define some of these roles, as the company and team grows, you can then add and remove roles from people based on the context, based on the situation. And it's no longer so traumatic to have a responsibility taken away from you or to need to shed some responsibility or to need to temporarily adopt some new responsibility because it's about assuming a new identity um, for, for a period of time. And when you, when you really support and embrace that, it makes everyone stronger. It makes them more resilient. And that resilience means they're able to adapt to change. So when something happens, um, there is a significant market event, and the whole company needs to shift and address something that's developed. Maybe um, Amazon has acquired a company that is providing exactly the same service that you're providing. Um, maybe something else has happened where the, just the rationale totally changes for your company and you, everyone has to move together. If you've figured out what the roles are, you can pull everyone together and recombine in a way that lets you quickly face the new challenge. When the challenge passes, you can maybe revert back or uh, revert to a new, a new evolution. So how do, you, how do you actually do that? Um, with stories. So one of the things that I love about this conference and about other conferences is getting to talk to people in other organizations about their stories. And those stories are very, very powerful. What's actually happening when you're sharing stories is you are constructing, you're, you're participating in identity negotiation. It's very, very sophisticated, and they're, they're, they're sort of a very powerful, very sharp tool. Um, you, you need to, as you create these roles, start searching for the right abstractions and the right roles. You're guaranteed not to get it right at once, at, at, at first, right? You're, you're guaranteed that the first attempt is not gonna be quite right. So how do you understand uh, which ones are working and which ones aren't? You really need to encourage all of the people who are having experiences in your organization to share stories. And they don't have to be big stories, they don't have to be formal stories, and they don't have to be true stories. They just need to be stories. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more about, about true stories, because they're, they're really about what someone is experiencing. And so a story of lived experience is very real and true for the person who experienced it. It doesn't mean that that was the intent, but it does, it, it does mean that that story was true for that person. And if you really want to understand how your teams are working together, you need to observe what people are experiencing and, and listen to those stories and then be willing to try and influence what stories people tell. You can't control what, what's happening. You can't control people's experience, but you can influence it for the positive or for the negative. So a couple of, a couple of um, big ideas that are, or frameworks that help with this. One is Kinevin. Uh, so you may, have heard of, you may have heard of this, it's, a, it's called a sense-making framework. Um, it actually came out of IBM and partially informed by the um, creator's experiences of being at a small company and being absorbed by a very, very large company and facing exactly all of these sorts of problems of identity negotiation, information sharing, and so on. So, th so this merges a couple of things. One, um, this Kinevin diagram in particular talks about complexity and complex systems. And it's a very interesting framework um, because it gets you out of the mindset of thinking that one size fits all for process and for team organization. What actually happens is that inside an organization, teams and the organization itself move to the different complexity domains at different points in time. And so if you're, if you're working in something that's very, very straightforward um, and you have a lot of understanding, it's very, very clear exactly cause and effect, 
you're in the obvious domain. And so maybe working a help desk on a, on a well-understood product, um, you know, you have the, the top 10 things that people call in about, and it's very, very well understood. Um, the, the amount of information sharing that works there is totally different from when you're working in a complicated domain. And a complicated domain is more like writing software, where you don't know exactly cause and effect, you don't know exactly best practice, you know some good practices, and um, you know some experts who are definitely interested in figuring this out and can, can figure out the right answer. That's the complicated domain. Um, complex is where it's way more unstable. You don't even necessarily know um, a type of expert who's interested in this problem. Uh, you might know one person. You're, there's a lot of discovery happening here. So some of the processes that we see being used in organizations actually are attempts to shift the company and the set of teams within that company from one of these domains into another. So one that we see all the time is um, a startup grows very, very quickly, and there's lots of chaos. They're in complex. They're discovering product market fit. They're discovering all of this stuff. And as they want to, to stabilize, they bring in processes like Scrum or, or um, other development practices, and that attempts to shift things from complex to merely complicated. Um, another thing that we see happening is companies that are very, very large and very, very stable. So think of your Fortune 100 companies who've been around for 100 years. Um, they might recognize that they're starting to lose relevance with a new generation. The world is changing around them. And so staying safe and simple and obvious uh, where they have best practices, continuing to follow those best practices, isn't going to work anymore. They might deliberately tip over some teams into chaos. And the way they do that is by things like inviting an outside design firm to help them figure out ideas for a new brand and a new company. So you think about that, that, that is really taking like a group of people who were inside this totally stable place and putting them in a very, very chaotic environment. And they need to do a lot of things to make that safe. Um, provide some ritual around it, provide some time boxes, some parameters, really make it safe to fail. So this, this Kinevin framework is very, very interesting as um, a way of thinking about what is the situation that my team is in right now and, and the frustrations that I might be feeling about collaboration or lack of collaboration with other teams. What's, that, what's the actual right thing to do for our current context? What identity should I be trying to negotiate? And how do you discover that? How do you figure it out? Um, it's the stories. And so um, Kinevin was created by Dave Snowden and Cynthia Kurtz. Um, Cynthia also did um, this whole book, Working With Stories. And um, th it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, you, it's also dangerous, it's a sharp tool. So becoming an expert at working with stories is to become an expert at controlling a propaganda machine. Um, and you can do a lot of good with it, and you can also do a lot of damage with it. So it's, it's really important not to just get excited about the stories and go off and accidentally do a bunch of damage with them, but to really understand the appropriate times to use them and, and the, the not appropriate times to use them. But the idea is, it, there's these three big ideas. Um, participatory, narrative, inquiry. And so it's not about agreeing on a single story that is the definitive truth for an event or for the way a company works or the way a team works, but it's about listening and being listened to. So to ask people to participate in telling you what, what it's like for them joining your team, and then to share with them what, what it was like for you being in that team and having a new person join, um, and to ask each other what you learn from these stories. Um, it's, it's really, really fantastic technique. And Cynthia's book has so many great um, examples of how to conduct these story sessions uh, in, a, in a safe way, in a useful way, without, um, without having all kinds of chaos, uh, without having someone who's really good at sto telling stories just dominate the entire narrative. It's, it's a fantastic resource. Um, The other, the other thing that will be very useful as you start to use these techniques is to develop some rituals. 
And at first, it sounds like, whoa, that, man, rituals, those, those don't sound very good. Those sound like you're turning your brain off. Um, but they're actually really, really useful in negotiating identity. So I'll give you a, a, a few examples of some rituals that help negotiate one of your identities. So one would be a judge putting on robes, right? That judge is a person with feelings who had breakfast that they did or didn't like or missed their breakfast, um, that has political views, that um, lives in the world with the rest of us. But when they put on their robes and they come into the courtroom, there's ceremony and ritual that helps them transition into that role. This is the identity that is dominant for me right now. And that's very, very useful. Another one might be a pilot doing a pre-flight checklist. We're really, really happy that they go through that ritual, not just to make sure that the plane is safe, because there's lots of ways to do that, but to help them mentally shift into the identity of, I am a pilot right now, not someone who's dreaming about my next career, not, not anything else, I'm a pilot right now. Another ritual might be um, a developer running tests, right? So you sit down to work on something, you make sure, before you go to start changing something, you make sure you can get the test suite to pass. And that little ritual of running the tests, seeing green, helps you shift into, I am now working on this. I'm not negotiating salary, I am not doing all of these other things. Right now, I'm, I'm building a feature. Another ritual um, that I learned about this year, which I really, really love, is called Stand Down. So we have these, um, Lots of people do these stand-up meetings, right? A brief synchronization meeting at some point during the day to help a work group figure out what they're, what they're going to do for the day, what their priorities are. And that's a nice ritual for transitioning in, right? For adopting those identities. But we're people, and, and as, as I've worked a lot with remote teams, I've started seeing that people have a real hard time shifting away from their set of work identities. Uh, I, worked, I worked from home for nearly 10 years, and it was really, really hard to turn off at the end of the day and stop thinking about work. So um, someone at Outpace actually started this tradition, and then I encountered it at a company called Healthfinch, and they do stand down at the end of the day. It's a totally distributed team, and for the last 10 to 15 minutes of the day, they would have everyone who was able call in to a meeting um, in that work group. Uh, it wasn't the entire company, but just that work group, and talk about their day. We're done working. Um, you know, people would have, have a, um, a beverage open, whatever, whatever they liked. They would share some stories about what that day was like. And that helped them transition back into the identity of being a parent or a sibling or a community member instead of their, their primary identity being work. It was a really, really nice ritual. So you, as, you, as you search for the roles and identities, also search for the rituals that help transition, right? So you, you'll want to set those up around when is it time to share stories and tell stories, and when is it time to um, understand the context that I'm operating in and go do the best I can within the current constraints. So there's a bunch of source material for this. Um, please, please look at this stuff. I'll go backwards with the easiest to consume. So last year, there was a great Food Fight Show interview. It's a video interview on YouTube, really nice to watch, um, with Dave Snowden, who created, uh, co-created um, Kinevin Framework. And it's really, really interesting seeing how that applies to um, a bunch of DevOps. He also drops um, a bunch of other concepts that are currently being researched that are really, really interesting. Uh, if you're really serious about this, you need, to, you need to get the Working With Stories book. Cynthia Kurtz's work is absolutely amazing. Um, this has been referred to as open source Kinevin. It is used not just in technology, but organizations of all types and all stripes. Um, very, very good work. Also very, very relevant to community organizing. Um, another one that's really, really handy is Organizational Patterns of Agile Software Development. That's a book from a few years ago by James Coburn. James, um, I've seen him apologize for it, including the word agile in the title. It's a, book, it's a book about patterns inside organizations. And just it's got lots of pictures. It's really, really great. Just looking through that, you will immediately spot several things that match your current state, and you will probably spot things that match what your next state should probably be. Um, and we'll, it will give you some concepts to help you transition. Um, a lot of the inspiration for this talk was taken from 
a chapter out of the book on top, which is Bramble Bushes in a Thicket. That is one chapter. Um, Dave Snowden and Cynthia Kurtz wrote that together, and it is really tearing into in much more detail the concept of organizational identity and identity negotiation with stories. It's really, really good. It's Creative Commons licensed. You can download and read that. It's amazing. That is one chapter out of a bigger book. Um, I don't necessarily recommend buying that book unless you're seriously geeking out about this stuff. The book's like $100. Um, but it's a chapter about uh, a whole book on strategic networks. And that's got chapters pulled from a bunch of experts all over the place. So with that, um, I am looking forward to learning uh, from you. I hope, I hope you can think about good silos. The slides are there, so you can easily get the reference material. Um, and I'm really looking forward to going and sharing stories with you for the rest of the conference.